Section number one of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. Sending and Receiving Invitations the sending and receiving of invitations underlies social obligations it therefore behooves both senders and recipients to learn the proper form in which these evidences of hospitality should be dispatched and received in the majority of cases an invitation demands an answer if one is in doubt it is well to err on the side of acknowledging an invitation rather than on that of ignoring it altogether we will consider first such invitations as demand no acceptance but which call for regrets if one cannot accept such are cards to at-home days to teas and to large receptions unless any one of these bears on its face the letters r s v p responde s'il vous plaît answer if you please no acceptance is required if one cannot attend the function one should send one's card so that one's friend will receive it on the day of her affair cards for an at home the cards for an at home are issued about ten days before the function they bear the hostess's name alone unless her husband is to receive with her in which case the card may bear the two names as mr and mrs james smith the average american man does not however figure at his wife's at homes when these are held in the afternoon the exigencies of counting room and office hold him in thrall too often for him to be depended upon for such an occasion a plain heavy cream card simply engraved is now used for most formal invitations in preference to the engraved notes that were the rule ten years ago the card bears in the lower right hand corner the address of the entertainer in the lower left hand corner the date and the hours of the affair as wednesday october the nineteenth and under this from four until seven o'clock if the tea be given in honor of a friend or to introduce a stranger the card of this person is enclosed with that of the hostess if the affair be rather informal if however it be a formal reception it is well to have engraved upon the card of the hostess directly under her own name to meet miss smith if a woman wishes to be at home for a guest unexpectedly arrived and there is not time for the engraving of cards or if she prefers to be informal she may simply use her visiting card writing the name of her guest beneath her own and adding the date on which she will receive and the hours in the lower left-hand corner it is understood of course that abbreviations with the exception of p p c and r s v p are never to be used on invitations and social notes the recipient if sending cards instead of attending encloses a card for the guest or friend whom she has been invited to meet the evening reception the cards for an evening reception may be issued in the same style if not they are in the form of a regular invitation and in the third person as mr and mrs james smith request the pleasure of mr and mrs brown's company on wednesday evening october the nineteenth from eight to eleven o'clock two west clark street if this formal invitation bears r s v p in one corner 
it should be accepted in the same person in which it is written thus mr and mrs john brown accept with pleasure mr and mrs smith's invitation for wednesday evening october the nineteenth the reply to an invitation whether formal or informal should to guard against misunderstanding always explicitly repeat the date and the hour it is hardly to be supposed that any person who reads this book will be guilty of the outrageous solecism of signing his or her name to an invitation written in the third person but such things have been done abbreviations and figures the letters r s v p are often written or engraved entirely in capitals this is incorrect some people prefer to dispense with them altogether and to express themselves in the simpler fashion the favor of an answer is requested it will be noticed that figures are avoided the day of the week and such words as street and avenue must appear in full some people even write out the year in words but this looks heavy never use city or town on an envelope in place of the name of the city to announce an at home through the newspapers is to be avoided in cases of sudden descent of a friend who will remain for two or three days only it may be done in that case one must add that there are no invitations otherwise one's friends may not understand dances and teas invitations to dances are often issued in the same form as those to teas with dancing written or engraved in the corner of the card as with teas so with evening receptions a declinature must be sent in the shape of a card delivered on the day of the function the custom that some persons follow of writing regrets on such a card is not good form an invitation to a card party no matter how informal always demands an answer as the entertainer wishes to know how many tables to provide and the number of players she can count on cards to church weddings demand no answer unless the wedding be a small one and the invitations are written by the bride or one of the relatives in which case the acceptance or regret must be written at once and thanks expressed for the honor a crush church wedding is the one function that demands no reply of any kind if one can go well and good if one does not go one will not be missed from the crowd that will throng the edifice an invitation to a home wedding or a breakfast demands an answer and thanks for the honor addressing the envelopes while on the subject of invitations to large or formal affairs it may be well to touch on a point concerning which many correspondents write letters of agonized inquiry the addressing of envelopes to the different members of a family the question may one invitation be sent to an entire family consisting of parents sons and daughters is asked again and again to each of these there is an emphatic no is the answer if any person is to be honored by an invitation to a function he should be honored by an invitation sent in the proper way one card should be sent to mr and mrs blank another to the mrs blank still another to each son of the family one can foresee the day when each unmarried daughter will expect her own card so rapidly is feminine individuality developing each invitation is enclosed in a separate envelope but if desired all these envelopes may be enclosed in a larger one addressed to the head of the house the most important invitation one demanding an immediate answer is that to a dinner or luncheon 
be this formal or informal for stately formal dinners engraved invitations in the third person are sent but it is quite as good form and in appearance much more hospitable and complimentary for the hostess herself to write personal notes of invitation to each guest these may be in the simplest language as my dear miss door will you give mr brown and myself the pleasure of having you at dinner with us on thursday evening december the sixth we sincerely hope that you will be among those whom we see at our table that night dinner will be served at seven o'clock cordially yours louise brown an invitation to a married woman should always include herself and her husband but it is addressed to her because it is the woman who is supposed to have charge of the social calendar of the family this note may read my dear mrs aikman will you and mr aikman honor us by being our guests at dinner on thursday evening december the sixth at seven o'clock sincerely hoping to see you at this time i remain cordially yours louise brown the single man a note of invitation to a single man is written in the same way if the dinner to be given to any particular guest or guests this fact should be mentioned in the invitation as for instance will you dine with us to meet mr and mrs barrows and so forth single men are warmly appreciative of dinner invitations and who foresee no opportunity in the near future to return hospitality offered to them frequently send a box of flowers to their hostess on the day of her entertainment the invitation to dinner as soon as practical after the receipt of a dinner invitation the recipient should write a cordial note if accepting she should express thanks and the pleasure she or her husband and she will take in being present at the time mentioned as a rule the decision to accept or decline should be absolute as it is immediate only the greatest intimacy and extraordinary circumstances warrant the request that an invitation be held open even for a day the hostess must make her arrangements and she cannot do so until she has heard definitely from all those she has asked if a declinature is necessary let it be in the form of a recognition of the honor conveyed in the invitation and genuine regret at the impossibility of accepting it this may be worded somewhat in the following way my dear mrs brown mr aikman and i regret sincerely that a previous engagement makes it impossible for us to accept your delightful invitation for december the sixth we thank you for counting us among those who are happy as to be your guests on that evening and only wish that we could be with you cordially and regretfully yours jane aikman dinner engagements binding no matter how informal a dinner is to be if the invitation is once accepted nothing must be allowed to interfere with one's attendance unless one is so ill that one's physician absolutely forbids one leaving the house some wit said that a man's only excuse for non-attendance at such a function is his death in which case he should send his obituary notice as an explanation certainly it is that nothing short of one's own severe illness or the dangerous illness of a member of the family should interfere with one's attendance at a dinner should such contingency arise a telegram or telephone message should be sent immediately that the hostess may try to engage another guest to take the place of the one who is unavoidably prevented from being present when it becomes necessary to ask a guest to fill a vacancy 
the hostess will do best to explain the situation frankly while the guest on his part need feel no slight at the lateness of his invitation a clever woman always has several persons on whom she can rely for such emergencies and whose good nature she does not fail to reward the luncheon all the rules that apply to the sending and receiving of invitations to a dinner prevail with regard to a luncheon it is next in importance as a function and the acceptance or declinature of a letter requesting that one should attend it must be promptly dispatched in planning any social affair the hostess should think twice about asking together people who have had for a long time lived in the same neighborhood or who are old residents of the city in any part but who are not apparently in the habit of seeing one another sometimes it is safer to ask one's prospective guests outright if it will be agreeable for them to meet before closing this chapter we should like to remind the possible guest that an invitation is intended as an honor the function to which one is asked may be all that is most boring and the flesh and spirit may shrink from attending it but if one declines what is meant as a compliment let one do it in a manner that shows one appreciates the honor intended to decline as if the person extending the invitation were a bit presumptuous in giving it or to accept in a condescending manner is a lapse that shows a common strain under a recently acquired polish a thoroughbred accepts and declines all invitations as though he were honored by the attention in doing so he shows himself worthy to receive any compliment that may under any circumstances be extended to him would that more of the strugglers up society ladders would appreciate this truth if a woman wishes to give any other special form of entertainment than a dance she writes a suitable word music bridge garden party etc in place of the word dancing for a dinner dance one sends a note or an engraved card with dancing at ten or cotillion at eleven in the corner to the comparatively small number asked to dine the guests asked for the dance receive only an at-home card with the announcement dancing at ten in the corner the tea dance the tea dance or the dansant has recently been revived this calls for an at-home card and the word dancing in the corner it is merely an ordinary afternoon tea at which space and music are provided for the young people to whirl about some people who entertain formerly a great deal keep on hand a supply of large engraved cards with a space left blank in which the name of the guest is written this is certainly a time-saving custom but the appearance of such a card is less elegant than one wholly engraved while on the other hand it lacks the real cordiality of the written note aiming at a combined effect it hardly achieves either of the things desired a minor but amusing blunder sometimes made by the thoughtless persons consists in inviting guests for dinner the ducks and salad ices and cakes are for dinner the guests should be asked to it a woman may take an out-of-town visitor to any large affair without obtaining permission beforehand but she will of course in speaking to her hostess express appreciation of the pleasant opportunity thus afforded to her guests cards after a death after a death has taken place one will not for a month or six weeks 
intrude on the seclusion of the family by sending any social invitations after that time however they should be sent as usual it is the personal privilege of the bereaved to determine how soon and to what extent they will resume their relations with society if one is in mourning one cannot of course with propriety become a member of any gay company but nowadays mourning is not always assumed even by the most grievous stricken if such persons find their burden more easily borne by the resumption as far as may be of their normal activities it is the part of kindness to aid them in making this resumption as easy and natural as possible it is now considered correct to send all invitations by mail though in some southern places the more elegant if difficult method of delivering them by hand of a servant is still cherished many informal invitations are now extended by telephone how invitations began dinner and wedding invitations and cards for evening receptions are issued in the names of both host and hostess for a ball or a garden party the name of the hostess may appear alone though this is not unusual a young girl should never announce any but the smallest and most informal parties in her own name yet many young girls do so ignoring their mothers and contributing unwittingly to our national reputation for bad manners a bishop and his wife if they are issuing cards to a large reception often do it in this way the bishop of indiana and mrs hereford request the honor etc an invitation should never begin you are cordially invited etc it should always be issued in the name of some person or persons the men's club invites you or the diocesan society requests the honor of is good form end of section one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section two of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phone marion harland's complete etiquette by marion harland cards and calls the styles of calling cards change from year to year even from season to season so that it is impossible to make hard and fast rules as to the size and thickness of the bits of pasteboard or the scripts with which they are engraved any good stationer can give one the desired information on these points in choosing a card plate it is well to select a style of script so simple yet elegant that it will not be outré several seasons hence unless one's purse will allow one to revise one's plate with each change of fashion it should not be necessary to remark that a printed card is an atrocity even a man's business card should be engraved not printed it is no longer considered proper for one card to bear the husband's and wife's names together as was a few years ago the mode thus mr and mrs charles sprague still some persons have a few cards thus marked and use them in sending gifts from husband and wife as a rule however the husband's card is enclosed in an envelope with that of his wife in sending gifts regrets and the like the card of a matron the card of a matron bears her husband's full name unless she is a divorcee thus mrs george williams brown even widows retain the style of address in the lower right hand corner is the address and in the lower left hand corner one's at home days are named as tuesdays until lent or wednesdays in february and march or thursdays until may nicknames and abbreviations are for intimate use only and should never appear on cards or invitations 
a girl should distinguish between kitty and catherine sarah and sally however in the south many girls are christened sally and this is accepted as her full and proper name accordingly a young woman's cards bear her name miss blank if she be the oldest or only daughter in a family the address on her cards is in the lower left hand corner if she has an older sister the card reads miss mary hilton blank a man's card is much smaller than that of a woman and often has no address on it unless it be a business card which must never be used for social purposes the mister is put before the signature as mr james john smith by the time a boy is eighteen he is considered old enough to have his cards marked with the prefix mister until that time he is on the rare occasions when he is formally addressed master the use of titles a clergyman's card is correctly engraved thus the reverend james vernon smith a bishop is entitled to the greater distinction the right reverend a physician or a judge may use his title or not as he prefers army and navy officers invariably employ theirs except when the rank is as low as that of a lieutenant when the full name prefixed by mister is used and below it lieutenant of third cavalry united states army a woman with a daughter-in-law moving in society in the same city as herself may with propriety have her card engraved simply mrs brown or she may follow the graceful foreign custom and be known as madame brown which gives a pretty touch of dignity and makes it easy for callers to designate which of the two ladies they wish to see if both are living in the same house a married woman never takes her husband title no matter what that may be she is never mrs judge blank or mrs colonel blank even the president's wife is simply mrs cleveland or mrs harrison addressing the president in direct address the president of the united states is mr president the vice president is mr blank members of the cabinet are secretary a or secretary b when introduced and are addressed as mr secretary senators are always addressed by their titles but representatives are mr except in naval and military circles titles expire with office the man who was governor or mayor last year should not be introduced as ex-governor blank or ex-mayor blank perhaps there is no social obligation that is more neglected and ignored than that of calling at proper times and regular intervals in the rush and hurry of american life it is well nigh impossible for the busy woman to perform her duty in this line unless she have a certain degree of system about it to this end she should keep a regular calling list or book and pay strict heed to the debit and credit columns it will require much management and thought to arrange her visits so that they will always fall on the at-home days of her acquaintances when a woman has an at-home day it is an unwarrantable liberty for any one to call at any other time unless it be on business or by special invitation or permission as many women have the same day at home one must limit the length of a call to fifteen or twenty minutes upon a casual acquaintance never making it longer than half an hour even at the house of a friend how to say good-bye one should learn to take one's departure on a remark of one's own not hurrying away the moment one's friend ceases to talk on the other hand lingering good-byes in ordinary intercourse are a mistake and suggest that one lacks the finesse necessary to manage a polite withdrawal an amusing story was told in a recent magazine and vouched for as true in which two young southern lads making their first formal call were driven to stay all night because they could not get away they were so timid some persons seem to feel that there is a certain amount of pomp and circumstance about calling on an at-home day and a novice in society asks timidly what she has to do at such a time she has to do simply what she would do on any other day when she is sure of finding the hostess in and disengaged the caller hands her card to the servant opening the door then enters the parlour greets her hostess who will probably introduce her to any other guest who happen to be present unless there be a large number of these in which case she will probably be introduced to a few in her immediate vicinity 
the caller will chat for a few minutes take a cup of tea coffee or chocolate offered her with a biscuit sandwich or piece of cake or decline all refreshment if she prefers at the end of fifteen or twenty minutes she will rise say good afternoon to her hostess murmur a good afternoon to the company in general and take her departure if her card has not been taken by the servant who opened the door for her the caller may lay it on the hall table as she goes out refreshments for callers when a woman is at home one day a week for several months she is expected to make very little preparation in the way of refreshment for her chance guests the tea tray is ready on the tea table at one side of the room and upon it are cups and saucers teapot canister and hot water kettle a plate of thin bread and butter or sandwiches or biscuits or another of sweet wafers or fancy cakes stand on this table sugar and cream and sliced lemon complete the outfit the kettle is kept boiling that fresh tea may be made when required and a servant enters when needed to take out the used cups if there are many callers the services of this maid may be required to assist in passing cups and sugar and cream otherwise the hostess may attend to such matters herself chatting pleasantly as she does so it is not incumbent on a caller to take anything to eat or drink unless she wishes to do this when one attends half a dozen such at homes in an afternoon one would have to carry a bag like that worn by jack the giant killer of fairy lore if one were to accept refreshments at each house the hostess should therefore never insist that a guest eat and drink if she has declined to do so how many cards to leave in calling on a married woman a matron leaves one of her own cards and two of her husband's her card is for the hostess one of her husband's is for the hostess and the other for the man of the house if there be several ladies in the family as for instance a mother and two daughters the caller leaves one of her own and one of her husband's cards for each woman and an extra card from her husband for each man of the household this is the general rule but it must have some exceptions for instance in a household where there are five or six women it is ridiculous to leave an entire pack of visiting cards in this case a woman leaves her card for the ladies and leaves it with her husband's also for the ladies one of his cards is also left for the man of the family or if there be several men it may be left simply for the gentleman if one knows that there is a guest staying at a house at which one calls one must send in one's card for this guest or if one have a friend staying in the same town with one and one calls on her it is a breach of good breeding not to inquire for the friend's hostess and leave a card for her whether she appear or not when an engagement is made known the members of the man's family should immediately call on his fiancée and her family and a formal dinner should be given for them within two weeks the black edged card custom clings to the black edged card for those in mourning it has its uses and surely its abuses for those in deep mourning it is a convenience to send in the form of regrets as the black edge gives sufficient reason in itself for the non-acceptance of invitations it may also be sent with gifts to friends if one uses it as a calling card the border should be very narrow if one is in such deep mourning that one's card must appear with a half inch of black around it one is certainly in too deep mourning to pay calls until the black edge can be reduced to the less ostentatious eighth of an inch width the owner would do well to shun society nor should a black edged card accompany an invitation to a social function several seasons ago a matron introduced to society in a large city a niece who had eighteen months before lost a brother with the hostess's invitations to the reception was enclosed the card of the young guest and this card had a black border an eighth of an inch wide the recipients of the invitations were to be pardoned if they wondered a bit at the incongruity of a person in mourning receiving at a large party under the circumstances she should have declined to have the social function given in her honour or should have laid aside her insignia of dolor if then one has reached a point where one is ready to re-enter society let one give up the morning cards and again use plain white bits of pasteboard calling after a death 
in calling at the house after a bereavement it is well except when the afflicted one is an intimate friend to leave the card with a message of sympathy at the door one may if one wishes leave flowers with the card a fortnight after the funeral one may call and ask to see the ladies of the family adding that if they do not feel like seeing callers they will please not think of coming down under such circumstances only a supersensitive person will be hurt by receiving the message that the ladies beg to be excused and that they are grateful for the kind thought that prompted the call the rule that we have just given applies to the household in which there is serious illness a call may consist of an inquiry at the door and leaving a card this may be accompanied by some such message as please express my sincere hope that mrs smith will soon be better and assure mr smith that if i can be of any service to him or mrs smith i shall be grateful if he will let me know making party calls one should always return a first call within three weeks after it has been made after a dinner luncheon or card party a call must be made within a fortnight an afternoon tea requires no party call after a large reception one may call within the month after a wedding reception one must call within a fortnight on the mother of the bride and on the bride on her at home day as soon as possible after her return from the wedding trip if one is in doubt as to the propriety of calling after an invitation it is better to err on the side of making the call one's courteous intention will surely be appreciated while not to call may seem an unpardonable omission in the case of an invitation extended without a first call having been made women sometimes express doubt as to the course they should pursue in the first place they will do well to realize that some of the people who entertain most delightfully are extremely busy people to whom the rigid routine of formal etiquette would be an intolerable burden a clever woman is known by nothing more certainly than by the unerring instinct with which she relaxes her demands in such instances if the woman who wishes to entertain encloses her own card this may be accepted as a substitute for the usual first call the social value of one dinner invitation transcends many calls even if the visiting card is not enclosed the recipient of the invitation will if she be a sensible woman accept if she really wishes to do so at this point however social usage should begin to assert itself and the invited one should not fail to make the customary call of appreciation after the party if one does not wish to make the acquaintance offered a formal note of declination will serve to discourage further intrusion exceptions to social rules a rather surprising question sometimes asked is whether one should call after a dinner or dance invitation that has been declined certainly the call should be made one has been honoured by one's friend and the fact that one was prevented by circumstances from actually enjoying their hospitality makes no difference whatever with one's responsibility for expressing appreciation a card with a message written on it fills many convenient social needs but it should never be used to take the place of a formal note so employed it suggests haste and a degree of indifference that are contrary to the best breeding the corners of cards are no longer turned down for any purpose if one on calling is told by the servant opening the door that mrs brown is not at home this does not mean literally that mrs brown is of necessity out of the house neither does it mean that the servant has been instructed to tell an untruth not at home is an accepted abbreviation for not at home to visitors there are those to whom the phrase will however always have a disagreeable ring and if mrs brown have more tact and originality than the conventions demand she will probably direct her maid to say instead mrs brown is not receiving today she receives on mondays who should call first who calls first the custom of residence calling on the newcomer is so firmly established in almost all communities that one may wonder at the question being asked yet in washington that is to say in official washington this custom is reversed and it is the newcomer who calls at the white house on the vice president members of the cabinet etc in the case of the highest officials a return call is not expected but the courtesy is recognized by an invitation to some general reception 
custom in small towns. The hours for calling vary according to the community one is in, though no afternoon call should be made before three o'clock. In small towns and villages where supper is eaten at six o'clock, one should not prolong a call after five thirty. Evening calls in most American cities are usually made at eight o'clock or soon after, though in large eastern places where dinner is not served until seven, seven thirty or eight, the nine o'clock call is not unusual. Calls on the sick should be made with the greatest discretion. One should ascertain in the first place whether or not one's friend will really be equal to seeing one, and then stay for a few moments only. Sick bed visits especially should not be allowed to become visitations. Many a person with a chance for recovery has literally been talked into his grave by well-meaning callers. Intelligent nurses will quietly ask such people to remain away. End of section 2. Recording by phone. Section 3 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan. Chapter 3 Letter Writing. The writing of letters of the good old fashioned kind is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. People used to write epistles, now they write notes. Before the days of the stenographer, the typewriter, the telegraph, and the telephone, when people made their own clothes by hand, wove their own sheets, and had no time-saving machines, they found leisure to write epistles to their friends. Some of us are so fortunate as to have stowed away in an old trunk a bundle of these productions. The ink is pale and the paper is yellowed, but the matter is still interesting. All the news of the family, the neighborhood, gossip, the latest sayings and doings of the children and of callers, an account of books read, of the minister's last sermon, and of the arrival of the newest of many olive branches, filled pages. What must these same pages have meant to the exile from home? And how much there was in such letters to answer? Still, even in this day and generation, there are a few people who have so far held to the good old traditions that they write genuine letters. And, wonder of wonder, they answer questions asked in the letters written by their correspondents. Only those who have written questions to which they desired prompt answers appreciate how maddening it is to receive a letter that tells you everything except the answers to your queries. And this ignoring of the epistle one is supposed to be answering is a feature of the up-to-date letter writer. There is, even in friendly correspondence, a right and a wrong way of doing a thing. How not to write. The wrong and well-nigh universal way of treating a letter is as follows. It is read as rapidly as possible, pigeonholed and forgot. Weeks hence, in clearing out the desk, it's found. The handwriting recognized and it is laid aside to be answered later. When that later comes depends upon the leisure of the owner. At last, a so-called answer is hastily written without a second reading of the letter to which one is replying. Such a reply begins with an apology for a long, unavoidable silence, an account of how cruelly busy one is nowadays, a passing mention of the number of duties one has to perform, a wish that the two correspondents may meet in the near future, and a rushing final sentence of affection, followed by the signature. Such is the modern letter. If a correspondent is worth having, she is worth treating fairly. Let her letter be read carefully and laid aside until such time as one can have a half hour of uninterrupted writing. Then, let the letter one would answer be read and the questions it contained be answered in order and first of all. This is common courtesy, after which one may write as much as time and inclination permit. If one has not the time to conduct one's correspondence in this way, let one have fewer correspondence. It is more fair to them and to oneself. The good-looking note. 
Colored letter paper is in bad form unless the color be a pale gray or a light blue. From time to time, stationers have put upon the market paper outre in design and coloring, and the persons who have used it were just what might be expected. It reminds one of what Richard Grant White said of the words gents and pants. He noticed that the one generally wore the other. So paper that is such bad form as this is usually used by persons who are bad form. All good looking notes have considerable margin at the left hand. Punctilious people insist on a right hand margin also. Sealing the envelope. Plain white or cream paper of good quality is always in fashion. For social correspondence, this paper must be so cut that it is folded but once to be slipped into an envelope. At the top of the page in the middle may be the address as 123 West Barrows Street and the name of the city. Just now, this is the only marking that is used on the sheet. Although some persons have the initials or monogram or crest in place of the address, it is no longer fashionable to have the crest or monogram and the address also. The envelope is marked or not as one chooses. The use of sealing wax gives a touch of distinction for which few persons still take time. Only white or delicately colored wax is acceptable unless at holiday time when the festive touch given by scarlet is in season. Letterheads such as are used by business correspondents should never be used for social purposes. Even the businessman may keep in his office desk a choir or two of plain paper upon which to write society notes and replies to invitations. Nor is it permissible for him to use the typewriter in indicting these all his business correspondence may be conducted with the aid of the invaluable machine as he may, if he ask permission to do so, send letters to members of his own family on the typewriter. But all the other correspondence should be done with pen and ink. Unfortunately, morning stationery is still in vogue. The recipient of a black edged letter is often conscious of a distinct shock when she first sees the emblem of dolor and wonders if it contains the notice of a death. For this reason, many considerate followers of conventionalities do not use the black edged stationery, but content themselves with plain white paper marked with the address or monogram in black lettering. A social or friendly letter is frequently dated at the end at the left-hand lower corner of the signature. A business communication is dated at the upper right-hand corner. Addressing business firms. The expression, my dear Mr. Blank, is more formal than is dear Mr. Blank, and is therefore used in society notes. Do not, as some have done, begin dear with a capital. Unsophisticated persons sometimes hesitate to use the prefix dear. They may be assured that in this connection, it is merely a polite form with no sentimental flavor whatever. Business letters addressed to a man should begin with the name of the person to whom they are intended on one line, the salutation on the next as Mr. John Smith on the upper line and below this, dear sir. In addressing a firm consisting of more than one person, write the name of the firm as Smith, Jones, and Company. Then below, dear sirs, the salutation gentlemen in such a case is old fashioned, but is preferred by some ceremonious persons who also like to put ESQ after a man's name on an envelope in place of putting Mr. before it. The signature. It should be unnecessary to remind women not to preface their signatures with the title Mrs. or Miss. Such a mistake stamps one as a vulgarian or an ignoramus. The name in full may be signed as 
Mary Bacon Smith, if the writer be a married woman, and the person to whom she writes does not know whether she be married or single, she should write her husband's name with the preface Mrs. below her signature, or in the lower left-hand corner of the sheet as Mrs. James Hayes Smith. An unmarried woman will save her correspondent embarrassment by putting Miss Brown in parentheses in this corner. To sign one's name prefaced by first letter is no longer considered good form. J. Henry Wells should be John Henry Wells. If one would use one initial letter instead of the full name, let that letter be the middle initial, such as John H. Wells or J. H. Wells. The postal card. I wish I could impress on all followers of good form that a postal card is a solecism except when used for business purposes. If it is an absolute necessity to send one to a friend or a member of one's family, as when stopping for a moment at a railroad station, one wishes to send a line home telling of one's safety at the present stage of the journey. The sentences should be short and to the point and unprefaced by an affectionate salutation. All love messages should be omitted as should the intimate termination that is entirely proper in a sealed letter, affectionately or lovingly, are out of place when written upon a postal card. Expressions such as, God bless you, or I love you, or love to the dear ones, are in shockingly bad taste, except under cover of an envelope. A good rule to impress on those having a penchant for the prevalent postcard is as follow. Use for business when brevity and simplicity are the order of the day. Never use for friendly correspondence unless the purchase of a sheet of paper, envelope, and postage stamp is an impossibility. The friendly letter may be as long as time and inclination permit. The business communication should be written in as few and clear sentences as possible. Someone has said that to write a model business letter, one should begin in the middle of it. In other words, it should be unprefaced by any unnecessary sentences, but should begin immediately on the business in hand. Continue and finish with it, for such letters, very truly yours, is the correct ending. Unless, as in the case of a man or firm addressing a letter to a person totally unknown to the writer and of marked eminence when the expression respectfully yours may be used. Letters of condolence. Many people consider letters of congratulation and condolence the most difficult to write. This is because one feels that a certain kind of form is necessary and that conventional and stilted phrases are proper under the circumstances. This is a mistake. For going on the almost unfailing principle that what comes from the heart goes to the heart. The best form to be used towards those in sorrow or joy is a genuine expression of feeling. If you are sorry for a friend, write to her that you are and that you are thinking of her and longing to help her. If you are happy in her happiness, Say so as cordially as words can express it. It happens now and then that even the quietest person wishes to write a man of political prominence. Such persons, whether they be diplomats or members of Congress, may properly be addressed as Honorable Mr. The President is the Honorable, the President of the United States. To use the article, before the title is more elegant. Bishops of any church are entitled to the prefix, the right reverend. In conversation, the rector of a high Episcopal church is often affectionately addressed as father. But this form of greeting would not be used on an envelope. The dean of a cathedral should be addressed as the very reverend. 
Very small paper and envelopes for society notes are less used than formerly. Many persons preferring what are called correspondence cards, heavy cream, white, single cards on which a few lines may be written and which are slipped into envelopes without folding. Letters of introduction. Letters of introduction should bear on the outside of the envelope in the lower left hand corner the words introducing miss in order that the two thus brought together may be saved any momentary embarrassment. They should not be sealed. One should be very careful not to give these letters unless one is reasonably warranted in making a demand on the time and courtesy of the person on whom one is making the social draft. To give one's card by way of introduction makes less of a demand on one's friend than does a letter. A woman does not present a letter of introduction in person. A man does. When one avails oneself of a member of one's family or a friend as messenger, one should write on the envelope in the lower left-hand corner. Kindness of Mary or politeness of Miss Briggs. In closing, a stamp. We cannot close this chapter on letter writing without a word to the person who writes a letter asking a question on his own business and fails to enclose a stamp. This is equivalent to asking the recipient on whom one has no claim to give one the time required for writing an answer to one's query and a two cent stamp as well when the matter on which one writes is essentially one's own business and not that of the person to whom one writes and from whom one demands a reply, one should always enclose a stamp, thus making the favor one asks of the least possible trouble to one's correspondent. Some people enclose a stamped and self-addressed envelope but as the other person's paper may not fit the envelope and the well-meant courtesy often defeats itself. Promptness in answering. In all business and society correspondence, a letter should be answered as soon as possible after it is received. One may afford to take a certain amount of liberty with one's friends and lay aside a letter for some days before answering it. But, the acceptance or declinature of an invitation and the answer to a business communication should be sent with as little delay as possible. End of section three. Recording by Laura Stinchcomb. Section four of Marian Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan. Chapter 4 Introductions. This matter of introductions is one rather too lightly considered on our free American soil. Unless the social exigencies are such as to make the atmosphere formal and unpleasant, if people are unknown to each other, it is taking a liberty to present a man to a woman without first and privately asking her permission. It is a woman's privilege to decline or to accept masculine acquaintance as she chooses. If she grants permission for the introduction, the person who has asked such permission brings the man in question to her and says, Miss A. May I have the pleasure of presenting Mr. B to you? We have all been witness at some time or other of that most unconventional performance where the woman in the case allows herself to be dragged across the floor to the man concerned. We have all on occasion heard the proper form so twisted as to make the woman the person presented instead of the man. This is the worst sort of no form. The social convention prescribes that the man shall take the initiative in requesting the introduction, that he shall seek the lady, 
that he shall be the person presented. Introducing one's husband. An American woman in presenting her husband will usually say, my husband, Mr. Smith. An English woman would be more formal. She would say simply, Mr. Smith. When a man is presented to a woman, if she is seated, she need not rise, but may merely bow. In case the man is distinguished or elderly, or if he be a warm friend of her husband or her guest, she will rise and shake hands. Never awkwardly drag a newcomer around to every person in a large circle. Introduce him to several of those nearest and later such further introductions as are desirable will naturally follow. When the group includes a half dozen only, it is necessary to introduce all round. In this case, the ceremony may be gracefully shortened by repeating two or three names together. Thus, Mrs. Brown, Mrs. Smith, may I present Mr. James? Never introduce your sister or your daughter if she be grown merely as such. The other person will be confused, not knowing whether the one introduced is married or single and hence in doubt as to what name to use. Clerical Introductions At a reception given to an Archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, it is customary for devout Catholics to kiss the ring, but Protestants may merely shake hands. A cardinal ranks as a prince of the Roman Catholic Church and is addressed as his eminence. Women, as well as men, are presented to him, not he to them. A woman is also presented to a bishop. When two women of about equal age and importance are to be introduced, merely mention the two names thus, Mrs. A, Mrs. B. The general rule in all introductions is to present the woman to the man. The young man or young woman to the elderly, the unmarried woman to the matron, when of about the same age. One may say, may I present, or with two men of near the same age, I want you to know. Never say, let me make you acquainted with. That is provincial. Addressing the queen. The American who goes abroad expecting to be presented at court must, of course, acquaint himself with the etiquette of that court. He will receive such advice as he needs from his ambassador, but it may be useful for him to know ahead of time some of the things that are required of him, or more precisely, of her. For court presentations are much more coveted and sought after by American women than by men. However, it is understood that a man whose wife has been presented is himself eligible to attend the king's next reception for gentlemen only. The English queen is addressed simply as ma'am by all Americans who have the honor of presentation. King George would be addressed as sir. The Prince of Wales is prince and his wife princess. The phrase, Your Majesty, is reserved for use by the lower English classes. An American, by virtue of having no rank at all, takes rank with the highest when he is introduced at court. A duke, addressed simply as duke, and a marquis by his title, Lord blank. The daughter of dukes, marquises, and earls must be given their Christian names, as Lady Mary Towers. The sons should be addressed as Lord John Towers, Lord Henry Towers. An archbishop is properly addressed as Your Grace or My Lord, but his wife is plain Mrs. Blank. Members of foreign royal families have the title of Prince and Princess. A baron visiting in this country 
would be presented to the American ladies he meets quite like any other gentleman. And his wife would not take precedence of them unless she happens to be elderly. When in a friend's house, one should bear in mind that introductions are the natural prerogative of the host and hostess. One should not, however, allow an awkward situation to develop from a too rigid observance of this rule. Professional men. Remember that many professional men do not like to be called professor because of the cheap ways in which this title has in recent years been used. By a little tact, in individual instances, one can learn which is preferred, professor or mister or doctor, if the person in question be entitled to that distinction. In making introductions, a clever man or woman often adds a word of comment that will help the two meeting to start their acquaintance on a friendly and intelligent basis. End of section four. Recording by Laura Stinchcomb. Section five of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harlan. Chapter 5 After 6 O'Clock. For most of us, the active business of the day is over at sundown. Mothers of large families, physicians, and occasionally other workers are employed over time. But most of us can count on leisure after 6 o'clock. Much of our happiness depends upon how this leisure is employed. That it should afford recreation of one sort or another is a commonly accepted opinion, though one that is accepted usually without appreciation of the obligations involved. Recreation implies something more than idleness. One cannot be amused in any worthwhile sense without sitting up and paying attention. Foreigners complain habitually that Americans take their pleasure sadly, that they do not go in for gaiety with spirit. We are much more vital in our attitude toward work than toward play. We know that we must pay for success in labor of any sort, but the debt we owe to amusement is a point not yet so widely grasped. Pleasure is shy of the person who makes only occasional advances to her. She must be courted habitually in order to give full return. We are all acquainted with the dull, unhappy appearance of the sedulous man of business off for a rare holiday. He is out of his element. He knows how to behave himself at work, but he is not acquainted with the fundamental principles of having a good time. These cannot be learned in a minute. One must have practice and enjoyment in order to carry off the matter easily. And this practice, should be a habit of everyday life. Many people who stand shyly off from the delights of the world and wonder why they are deprived of them fail to realize that diversion of any sort worthy the name is a thing for which one must make some effort. Home festivity. It is at home that one should cultivate the graces that make one attractive abroad. And this is only preliminary to saying that planning for the everyday recreation of a household should be as much a matter of course as devising ways and means for the purchase of food and clothing. The first requisite for bringing about an atmosphere of festivity and good cheer at home is to adopt in some degree the methods that one uses away from home. If one is invited to dinner, one makes some preparation for it. And so one should do for dinner at home. Externals have much to do with coaxing gaiety to live as a guest in the house. A pretty table and food managed with some regard to aesthetic values as well as to the palatable quality have a happy effect upon the mind and temper of the diners. A few flowers properly distributed assist still further. If all the inmates of a house are in the habit, as they should be, of making some change in their toilet for dinner, this of itself makes a sharp line of demarcation 
between the work time and the play time of the 24 hours. The hint of festivity in attire induces a happy and a festive frame of mind, imparts just that touch of difference from the habit of prosaic daylight necessary to send the mind sailing off into pleasant channels. The home dinner, the care for the dinner table, for the personal appearance, and, generally speaking, for pretty environment implies effort. Lazy people cannot hope for the delightful effects of a material kind. Neither can they expect the happiness which comes to those who take some pains at home for the mental entertainment of themselves and their household. There are many people who regard it as deceitful and insincere to forecast what one shall talk about, and it is quite true that formally Planned talk is a foe to spontaneity and naturalness. But usually the man or woman who entertains by his conversation is the person who, in a general way, has taken some thought about what he will say. Given the opportunity, conversation, charming in its spontaneity, rises out of the mental habit of noting down for future reference pleasant or odd experiences good stories, the quirks in one's own mind. One must not intrude these in a place where they do not fit, but it is not in the least a social sin to guide the talk toward your own thought, provided you do not thereby push out something better. We are all given tongues and with them a certain conversational responsibility. If each member of the family made it his business and his pleasure during the day to remember the best part of his experience that he might relate it at the dinner hour, some part of that gloom which descends upon so many American families at the evening meal would be dissipated. The time for play. If one cultivates the prettier touches of personal appearance for that part of the day after six o'clock, whether at home or abroad, one should also cultivate the pleasanter and more agreeable states of mind. Business should be put behind one. The petty cares of the day should go unmentioned. The ills of body and mind should be, as far as possible, forgot. Those little courtesies and formality of manner that we admire in the practiced man or woman of society are as decorative at home as a way and equally creative of a festive atmosphere. In one of the magazines of the last decade, there is a homely, effective story of a young girl just home from a house party and full of its gaiety, to whom the idea occurred that the methods employed by her hostess might make a delightful week in her own large family circle. She took the manor in hand and invited her mother to be the guest of honor for the seven days. Some entertainment was planned for each evening in the week, sometimes with visitors and sometimes not. The women of the family wore their best frocks frequently during the week. The prettiest china and the best silver were used as freely as if for company. The result of it all was that the family voted visiting at home a signal success. Games as pastime. There are many ways of providing amusement for evenings at home. One has space only for the mention of a few of these in a short article on the subject. Games of various kinds are an excellent resource for making the after dinner time pass pleasantly. They cultivate quickness of decision, sociability, a friendly rivalry. Success in games is partly a matter of chance but much more of attention and skill. Many people sniff at them who are too lazy to make the conquest of their methods. Charades, of which English people never grow tired as a means of diversion, have their ups and downs in the more quickly changing fashions of America. They provide one of the easiest and merriest means of entertainment. They may be of any degree of simplicity or elaboration and they call forth as much or as little ingenuity as is possessed by the actors in any given case. 
They are usually popular because almost everybody has latent a little talent for the actor's art at which he is willing to try his luck. Many people who are afraid to join in formal theatricals find an outlet for this taste in charades. And so informal usually is the kind of entertainment that the spectators enjoy the acting, whether well done or otherwise. It is enough to see one's friends and acquaintances struggling with the part. If well done, one enjoys the success. If not, one applauds the absurdity of the conception. Reading aloud. Reading aloud to a congenial home party has much to be said in its favor. In spite of its present reputation as a stupid means of passing an evening, the world may be divided into two classes, runs an old and favorably known joke. Those who like reading aloud and those who do not. Those who like it are those who do the reading. Those who dislike it are those who do the listening. The half-truth of this witticism must not be accepted for more than it is worth. As an occasional means of passing an evening, reading aloud is diverting and stimulating. The habit of spending one's evening in that way is not an encouragement to variety and liveliness of mind. One gets into the way of depending upon the author in hand for entertainment. Instead of depending upon the action of one's own mind, small doses of reading aloud are good. Continual doses are fatal to a proper social ideal. The popular house. The people who make their own houses a center of attraction are, generally speaking, happy people. The house where the evening is accepted as a time of diversion is the popular house. The atmosphere there begets gaiety and naturalness of manner. We have all had the experience of making evening calls where we were compelled to stand in the hall till the gas was lighted in the drawing room or the electricity turned on, where we must pass a dreary 15 minutes before the members of the family are ready to receive. This kind of preliminary puts a damper on the spirits of host and guests from which they do not easily recover. To be ready for pleasant evenings, to meet them halfway by one's attitude is a good recipe for ensuring their arrival. The Sunday Night Supper. A pleasant and informal method of ensuring good times in one's own house is to make a feature of the Sunday Night Supper. This is not so formal or expensive a mode of entertainment as dinner giving. It is a jolly and pleasant method. One may have everything in the way of edibles prepared for the meal in the morning, except perhaps one article to be made on the chafing dish. One may serve this meal with or without servants. Often the guests enjoy the freedom implied in helping the hostess carry off successfully the details of serving. The Sunday evening supper is one of those festivities that imply some elasticity in numbers. This is the sort of meal to which the unexpected guest is welcome, at which the person who happens in may feel entirely at ease. Where there are young people in the house, the Sunday night supper is an especially popular institution. They appreciate the delights of entertaining without the care or the formality of the more elaborate functions. Practicing courtesy. The ways of enjoying life away from home after six o'clock in the evening readily suggest themselves. There are the various functions to which one is invited. There is the theater, the most delightful of resources, but unfortunately one by which, by reason, of its expense is available frequently only by the rich. Receptions, dinners, card parties, and the theater all go to make this earth a more agreeable place to those who have the social instinct. But it must never be forgot that the fundamental place for the cultivation of this instinct is at home, which is the practice ground for formal and general society. End of section five, recording by Laura Stinchcomb.
Section 6 of Marian Harland's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Marian Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marian Harland. Chapter 6 Functions. The rules that apply to a dinner hold good at a luncheon to which function ladies only are usually invited although when served at twelve o'clock and called breakfast men are also bidden at a luncheon the women leave their coats in the dressing-room wearing their hats and gloves to the table the gloves are drawn off as soon as all are seated just why women elect to sit through an entire meal in a private house with their hats on is not readily explained and some independent hostesses request that hats be removed but if they are retained the gloves also should be worn to the table not taken off upstairs as is often done when the gloves are long some women merely pull off the lower part and tuck it into the wrist an ugly habit in given luncheons hostesses with beautifully polished tables often prefer to use doilies of linen or lace instead of a cloth more precise women never serve a meal without using a tablecloth but from an artistic point of view the shining surface of bare mahogany is charming luncheon guests should remember that their hostess may have engagements for the late afternoon and not ordinarily prolong their stay after three o'clock if luncheon has been at one formal receptions at an evening reception the guests ascend to the dressing-rooms if they wish or may leave wraps in the hall if a servant be there to take them when one comes in a carriage with only an opera wrap over a reception gown it is hardly worth while to mount the stairs but this must be decided by the arrangements made by the entertainers before one enters the drawing-room one deposits one's card on a salver on the hall table if there be a servant announcing guests the new arrival gives his name clearly and distinctly to this functionary who repeats it in such a tone that those receiving may hear it the guest enters the parlours at this moment proceeds directly to his hostess and after greeting her speaks with each person receiving with her he then passes on and mingles with the rest of the company an afternoon reception is conducted in the same manner the only difference being that at an evening function refreshments are more elaborate than at an afternoon affair and frequently the guests repair to the dining room if this be large at some day receptions this is also done but at a tea refreshments are usually passed in the drawing rooms a friend of the hostess usually pours the tea and the chocolate and other friends are asked to assist at successful receptions these ladies do not seek their especial friends among the guests but are rather on the outlook for any who may be strange or timid correct afternoon dress refreshments so elaborate that they will spoil the appetite for dinner are not to be served at afternoon affairs at the tea proper only tea bread and butter and little cakes are offered if more than this is served the occasion is more properly called a reception in any case the entertainment given in the afternoon should not take on the elaborate nature of an evening party and only in provincial communities is it allowed to do this many women in such places do not properly distinguish between afternoon and evening dress while a woman may suitably wear before six a gown slightly low in the neck she should not until after that hour wear one that is lower or whose sleeves do not come to the elbow the high tea is a sit-down affair really a very late luncheon it is said to have originated in philadelphia and is as one would expect a formal stately affair with an elaborate menu the guests have a delightful time but do not want any dinner that evening how to revive flowers 
it is useful to know that when on the afternoon of a reception or dinner flowers intended for decoration arrive from the florist in a wilted condition they may often be revived by plunging the stems in boiling water at a very large reception it is not now required that one force oneself on the attention of the hostess for the sake of taking formal leave one may instead depart whenever one is ready to do so music at a reception should not be so loud as to make talking difficult in any but the largest houses a harp stationed in a side room or hall is ample foreigners find our babel of voices at such affairs subjects of criticism but often indeed one must shout if one is to be heard oliver wendell holmes is said to have described the average afternoon tea in four words thus gibble gabble gobble git it cannot be denied that they often married the satire the coming out party the coming out party or reception at which the debutante makes her entrance in the world of society is conducted as is any other reception but the debutante stands by her mother and receives with her each guest speaks some pleasant word of congratulation on shaking hands with the girl her dress should be exquisite and she should carry flowers these flowers are usually sent to her when more are received than she can carry they are placed about the room if the coming out party be in the evening it is often followed by a dance for the young people in sending out invitations for such an affair the daughter's card is enclosed with that of the mother or her name is engraved below that of her mother's on the latter's card one may leave such a function as has just been described as soon as one likes and may take refreshments or not as one wishes just before departing the guest says good night to his hosts the hour at which one goes to a reception may be at any time between the hours named on the cards issued one should never go too early or if it can be avoided on the stroke of the first hour mentioned if the cards read eight thirty to eleven o'clock any time after nine o'clock will be proper and one will then be pretty sure not to be the first arrival of the company a card party is a function at which one should arrive with reasonable promptness if the invitations call for eight thirty one must try not to be more than ten or fifteen minutes late as the starting of the game will be thus delayed and the hostess inconvenienced after the game is ended refreshments are served and as soon after that as one pleases one may take one's departure serenity at cards it is surprising how many people at other times well bred quite lose their tempers at bridge or whist the scent of a prize seems to arouse in them a spirit of vulgarity one would not discredit them with processing if one met them away from the card table the only proper attitude in all games is one or serenity and courtesy no matter what unspeakable blunders your partner may commit the same rule of promptness applies to a musical after greeting the hostess guests take the seats assigned to them and chat with those persons near them until the programme is begun during the music not a word should be spoken if one has no love for music let consideration for others cause one to be silent if this is impossible it is less unkind to send a regret than to attend and be so doing mere others enjoyment of a musical feast at a ball or large dance one may arrive when one wishes the ladies are shown to the dressing-room then meet their escorts at the head of the stairs and descend to the drawing-rooms or dance hall here the host and hostess greet one after which one mingles with the company filling dance programmes at a formal dance programmes or orders of dance are provided each man and each woman receiving one as he or she leaves the dressing-room or enters the drawing-room 
upon this card a woman has inscribed the names of the various men who ask for dancers as each man approaches her with a request that he be given a dance she hands him her card and he writes his name on it then writes her name on the correspondent blank on his own card as he returns her program to her the man should say thank you the woman may bow slightly and smile or repeat the same words no woman versed in the ways of polite society will give a dance promised to one man to another unless the first man be so crassly ignorant or careless as to neglect to come for it should a man be guilty of this rudeness he can only humbly apologize and explain his mistake begging to be taken again into favor if he be sincere the woman must by the laws of good breeding consent to overlook his lapse but she need not give him the next dance he asks for unless she believes him to be excusable a man invited to a dance will properly pay particular attention to the young ladies of the family whose guest he is and will not neglect to ask their mother for one number if she be dancing a convenient phrase covering any doubt as to whether a girl or woman wishes to take active part in the festivities is are you dancing tonight the hostess at a dance the hostess at a dance must deny herself all dancing unless her guests are provided with partners or at least she should not dance during the first part of the evening if other women are unsupplied with partners at a large ball the hostess frequently has a floor committee of her men friends to see that sets are formed and that partners are provided for comparative strangers no hirelings will do this so skilfully or with so much tact as will the personal friends of the entertainers a young girl may after dance ask to be taken to her chaperon or to some other friend she should soon after the dance given to one man dismiss him pleasantly that he may ascertain the whereabouts of his next partner before the beginning of the next dance at a small house dance or other informal party the hostess sometimes provides for the proper attendance for the girls going home but it is not often wise to depend on this a girl if she is going to the home of an intimate friend need not have a chaperon but she should arrange that some one call for her and thus relieve her hostess of what is sometimes a trying responsibility if the guest be a mature woman she may enjoy absolute independence by taking a cab the etiquette governing weddings and wedding receptions will be explained in the chapters on weddings the engaged couple in our foremother's day the publicity of the declared engagement was a thing unknown now the behaviour of the affianced pair and what is due to them from society deserve a page of their own perhaps the most ill-at-ease couple are the newly married but the engaged couple presses them hard in this line to behave well under the trying conditions attendant upon a recently announced engagement demands tact and unselfishness it should not be necessary to remind any well-bred girl or man that public exhibitions of affection are vulgar or that self-absorption or absorption in each other is in wretched taste the girl should act toward her betrothed in company as if he were her brother or any trusted man friend avoiding all low-voiced or seemingly confidential conversation the man while attentive to every want and wish of the woman he loves must still mingle with others and talk with them forcing himself if necessary to recollect that there are other women in the world besides the one of his choice the fact that romantic young people and critical older ones are watching the behavior of the newly engaged pair and commenting mentally thereon is naturally a source of embarrassment to those who are nearly concerned in the matter but let each remember that people are becoming engaged each hour that no strange outward transformation has come over them and that all evidences of the marvellous change which each may feel has transformed life for him 
or her may be shown when they are in private if they love each other their happiness is too sacred a thing to be dragged forth for public view it is customary when an engagement is announced for the friends of the happy girl to send her flowers or some dainty betrothal gift she must acknowledge each of these by a note of thanks and appreciation announcing engagements it is not good form for a girl to announce her own engagement except to her own family and dear friends a friend of the family may do this either at a luncheon or party given for this purpose or by mentioning it to the persons who will be interested in the pleasant news when a girl is congratulated she should smile frankly and say thank you she should drill herself not to appear uncomfortably embarrassed the same rule applies to the happy man the conventional diamond solitaire ring is not worn until the engagement is announced wedding anniversaries the happily married often considered the great event of their lives of sufficient interest to the world at large to be commemorated by yearly festivities cards for wedding anniversaries bear the names of the married pair the hours of the reception to be given and the two dates thus june fifteen eighteen eighty to june fifteen nineteen o five if the anniversary be the silver wedding the script may be in silver if a golden wedding in gilt wooden wedding invitations engraved or written on paper in close imitation of birch bark are pretty at one such affair all decorations were of shavings and the refreshments were served on wooden plates the wooden wedding is celebrated after an interval of five years at a tin wedding tinware was used extensively even the punch being taken from small tin cups and dippers this wedding marks the flight of ten years of married life the reception is usually held in the evening and husband and wife receive together and if refreshments are served at tables they sit side by side it is proper to send an anniversary present suitable to the occasion such a gift is accompanied by a card bearing the name of the sender and the word congratulations it is customary to send such a gift only a day or two before the celebration of the anniversary an anniversary reception is just like a reception given at any other time and rules for conducting such a one apply to this affair to repeat the wedding ceremony as it's sometimes done is in bad taste christening parties in close sequence to weddings and wedding anniversaries we give a few general directions for the conduct of christening parties as the small infant is supposed to be asleep early in the evening the christening ceremony should take place in the morning or afternoon as it is not always convenient for the business man of the family to get off in the daytime on weekdays sunday afternoon is often chosen for such an affair every prayer book contains a description of the duties of godfathers and godmothers if one belongs to a church having such if not the father holds the child and the father and mother take upon them the vows of the church to which they belong after the religious service the little one is passed about among the guests and is then taken by the nurse to the upper regions while those assembled in its honour regale the inner man with refreshments provided for the occasion the godfather and godmother make a gift to the child usually some piece of silver or jewellery this is displayed on a table in the drawing-room with any other presents that the invited guests may bring or send it is the proper thing for the guests to congratulate the parents on the acquisition to the family and to wish the child health and happiness handsome calling gowns are en règle at a christening refreshments are often served en buffet at home weddings and at receptions but there is always some awkwardness attached to this method to provide small tables for one's guests to be seated at is much the better way when it is practicable you will seem more hospitable and your guests will be more comfortable the person who eats standing always has a catch a train look taking leave if obliged for any reason to leave unusually early at any party 
go as quickly as possible no hostess likes to have her entertainment broken off unseasonable the margin of manners never hesitate at any social gathering to speak pleasantly to any one you chance to be thrown with or to respond to any one who speaks to you even though no introduction has taken place in england few formal introductions are made as the phrase goes the roof is the introduction a passing courtesy of this sort commits you to nothing while it has a broad social value never indulge in snubs if you are open to no higher appeal remember that it pays to be civil all round james has spoken of the margin of manners it is a useful asset in recent years it has become permissible for the woman who wishes to give a large entertainment to do it at a clubhouse or in a hotel ballroom hired for the occasion frequently the room is made more attractive by the addition of rugs and other furnishings from the home of the hostess while the hired hall is a convenience and to the woman living in an apartment a necessity for receptions and dances it can never take an elegance and a spirit of true hospitality the place of entertaining under one's roof when one sees women of wealth and leisure resort to it because it saves bother you know one feels that these women must regard the events of social life as disagreeable duties rather than delightful opportunities with us bonnets before six but not after is the rule and this is also the custom in england but at former receptions in the evening in france the hat is retained the combination of picture hat and low-cut gown is particularly attractive and one wishes that american women would occasionally at least copy it have plenty of chairs if you give a musical be sure you provide plenty of chairs to do this one must unfortunately rent folding chairs and these always have a slight funeral aspect but that is better than compelling people to stand one wonders why women of large means who entertain on a corresponding scale do not buy several dozen of these chairs and stain them dark a woman who spoke of a certain house as hospital in appearance being asked what she meant answered there are so many places in it to sit a woman who is not willing to take the trouble to be a hostess should not ask people to her house in order to make even a simple entertainment a success it is necessary that there should be a directing though quiet influence some women are too strenuous as hostesses others are merely guests at their own parties here as elsewhere there is a medium course that is most to be desired the ideal society the spirit of an ideal society has been well expressed by emile in his famous journal in society people are expected to behave as if they lived on ambrosia and concerned themselves with nothing but the loftiest interests anxiety need passion have no existence all realism is suppressed as brutal in a word what we call society proceeds for the moment on the flattering illusory assumption that it is moving in an ethereal atmosphere and breathing the air of the gods all vehemence all natural expression all real suffering all careless familiarity or any frank sign of passion are startling and distasteful in this delicate milieu they at once destroy the common work the cloud palace the magical architectural whole which has been raised by the general consent and effort it is like the sharp cockcrow which breaks the spell of all enchantments and puts the fairies to flight the select gatherings produce without knowing it a sort of concert for eyes and ears an improvised work of art by the instinctive collaboration of everybody concerned intellect and taste hold festival and the associations of reality are exchanged for the associations of imagination so understood society is a form of poetry the cultivated classes deliberately recompose the idyll of the past and the buried world of austria paradox or no i believe that these fugitive attempts to reconstruct a dream 
whose only end is beauty represent confused reminiscences of any age of gold haunting the human heart or rather aspirations toward a harmony of things which every day reality denies to us and of which art alone gives us a glimpse a perfect social group speaking of a certain soiree the same writer emphasizes the fact that the most beautiful social groups are not confined to any one age or sex about thirty people representing our best society were there a happy mixture of sexes and ages there were grey heads young girls bright faces the whole framed in some obusson tapestry which made a charming background and gave a soft air of distances to the brilliantly dressed groups End of section six Recording by Monica Rolly. Section 7 of Marian Harland's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Monica Rolly. Marian Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marian Harland. Chapter 7 The Home Wedding. To a home wedding, invitations may be issued two weeks in advance. Their style depends upon how formal the function is to be. If a quiet family affair, the notes of invitation may be written in the first person by the bride's mother as My dear Mary, Helen and Mr. Jones are to be married on Wednesday, October the 13th at four o'clock. The marriage will be very quiet with none but the family and most intimate friends present. We hope that you will be of that number. Helen sends her love and begs that you will come to see her married. Faithfully yours, Johanna Smith. This kind of note is, of course, only permissible for the most informal affairs. For the usual home marriage, cards, which read as follows, may be issued. Mr. and Mrs. Nelson Brown request the pleasure of Mr. and Mrs. Blank's company at the marriage of their daughter on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 13th of October, at 4 o'clock at 144 Madison Square, Boston. Or the invitations may read, Mr. and Mrs. Nelson Brown request the pleasure of your company at the marriage of their daughter Helen Adams to Mr. Charles Sprague on Tuesday afternoon, October the 13th at 4 o'clock. RSVP may be added if desired. Some people prefer to request the honor of, etc., as more elegant. Wedding Cards Wedding cards are enclosed in two envelopes with the inner one bearing the name only and left unsealed. Sunday weddings are not good form and Friday is, owing to the old superstition, not popular. Probably more weddings take place on Wednesday than on any other day. At a home wedding the bride often has but one girl attendant and that one is the maid of honour. The bride tells her what kind of dress she wishes her to wear, and the bridegroom provides her bouquet for her. He also sends the bride her bouquet. The matter of expenses. The wedding expenses of the bridegroom are the flowers for the bride and her maid of honor or bridesmaids, the carriage in which he takes his bride to the train, the carriages for best man and ushers, and the clergyman's fee. Besides this, he usually provides his ushers and best man with a scarf pin. In some cases, he gives these attendants also their gloves and ties. Sometimes he does not. The bride's family pays all other expenses, including the decoration of the house, the invitations and announcement cards, and the caterer. If guests from a distance are to be met at a train by carriages, the bride's father pays for these. 
we would suppose that at a house wedding with which we have to do the only attendants are the best man to ushers and the maid of honour and that the ceremony is at high noon or twelve o'clock the matter of lights at this function is largely a question of taste if the day be brilliantly clear it seems a pity to shut the glorious sunshine from the house therefore many brides decline to have the curtains drawn at the noon hour many persons prefer the light from the shaded lamps and candles as being more becoming than the glare of day the wedding breakfast is provided by a caterer always when such a thing is possible it may consist of iced or jellied bouillon lobster cutlets chicken pâtés a salad with cakes ices and coffee this menu can be added to or elaborated as inclination may dictate sweetbread pâtés may take the place of chicken pâtés a frozen punch may take the place of the ordinary ices and if one wish a game course be introduced a heavy breakfast is however a tedious and unnecessary affair the bride's dress the bride's dress if she be a young girl must be white with a veil a train is advisable as it adds elegance and dignity to the costume the waist is made with a high neck and long sleeves and white gloves are worn the veil is turned back from the face and reaches to the bottom of the train where it is held in place by several pearl-headed pins a single fold of tulle hangs over the face being separated from the main veil this is thrown back after the ceremony the bridegroom wears a black frock coat grey trousers white waistcoat white tie light grey or pearl gloves and patent leather shoes his ushers dress in much the same fashion the maid of honour wears a gown of white or very light colour with a slight train and a picture hat or not as she wishes when becoming an entire costume of pale pink with a large hat trimmed with long plums of the same shade is very striking the bouquet carried by the bridesmaid will harmonize with the color of her gown of course the bride's bouquet will be white and is usually composed of her favorite blossoms the wedding ring the old fashion of ripping the third finger of the bride's left glove so that this finger might be slipped off for the adjusting of the ring is no longer in vogue instead of this the left-hand glove is removed entirely at that part of the ceremony when the ring is placed on the bride's finger by the bridegroom at a house wedding the guests assemble near the hour named leave their wraps in the dressing rooms then wait in the drawing room for the wedding the whole parlour floor is decorated with natural flowers garlands of these being twisted about the balustrades in making a bower of the room in which the marriage is to take place if one can afford to do so one may prefer to leave the matter of floral decorations to an experienced florist but any person with taste can successfully decorate the rooms a screen of green dotted with flowers may stand at the end of the room in which the marriage is to be solemnized and an arch of flowers is thrown over this within this arch the clergyman the bridegroom and the best man may await the arrival of the wedding guests as the wedding march begins the wedding procession the portieres shutting off the drawing-room from the hall are closed when the time arrives for the bridal party to descend the stairs as they reach the hall the strains of the wedding march sound one word as to the orchestra this should be stationed at such a distance from the clergyman and bridal party that its strains will not drown the words of the service since fashion decrees that music should be played during the service it should be so soft and low that it accentuates rather than muffles the voices of the participants in the ceremony 
loud strains detract from the impressiveness of the occasion and cause a feeling of irritation to the persons who would not miss a single word of the solemn service through the door at the opposite end of the room from that in which the bridegroom stands enters the wedding procession the two ushers come first having a moment or two before marked off the aisle by stretching two lengths of white satin ribbon from end to end of the room following the ushers walks the bridesmaid alone and after her on the arm of her father comes the bride at the improvised altar or at the cushions upon which the bridal couple are to kneel the ushers separate one going to each side the maid of honour moves to the left of the bride and the father lays the bride's hand in the hand of the bridegroom then stands a little in the rear until he gives her away after which point in the ceremony he steps back among the guests or at one side apart from the bridal group the best man stands on the bridegroom's right it is he who gives the ring to the clergyman who hands it to the bridegroom who places it on the finger of the bride receiving congratulations when the ring is to be put on the bride hands her bouquet to the maid of honour and draws off her left hand glove giving that also to the maid of honour who holds bows until after the benediction after congratulating the newly wedded pair the clergyman gives them his place and they stand facing the company to receive congratulations the bride's mother should have been in the parlour to receive the guests as they arrived and during the ceremony stands at the end of the room near the bridal party she should be the first to congratulate the happy couple the bridegroom's parents following those of the bride the maid of honour stands by the bride while she receives after congratulations have been extended the wedding breakfast is served at little tables placed about the various rooms the bride and her party may if desired have a table to themselves and upon this may be a wedding cake to be cut by the bride this is not essential and has of late years been largely superseded by the squares of wedding cake packed in dainty boxes one of which is handed to each guest on leaving when the time comes for the bride to change her dress she slips quietly from the room accompanied by her maid of honour the bridegroom goes to an apartment assigned to him and his best man to put on his travelling suit later the maid of honour may come down and tell the bride's mother in an aside that she may now go up and bid her daughter good-bye in the privacy of her own room afterward the young husband and wife descend the stairs together say good-bye in general to the guests awaiting them in the lower hall and drive off generally one regrets to say amid showers of rice as to practical jokes i would say just here that the playing of practical jokes on a bridal pair is a form of pleasantry that should be confined to classes whose intellects have not been cultivated above the appreciation of such coarse fun to tie a white satin bow on the trunk of the so-called happy pair so that all passengers may take note of them is hardly kind but jesting compared to some of the deeds done a few weeks ago the papers gave an account of a groomsman who slipped handcuffs upon the wrists of bride and bridegroom then lost the key and the embarrassed couple had to wait for their train chained together until a file could be procured by which time their train had left such forms of buffonery may be diverting to the perpetrator they certainly are not amusing to the sufferers the quiet wedding this is refined a girl who is to be married quietly with only relatives or intimate friends present often says in explaining this fact i am not going to have a wedding the expression is not well chosen 
for it inevitably suggests that the glitter of the ceremony is in her eyes more important than the solemn words which are the wedding End of section seven recording by monica raleigh